Okay. Let me pull out the questions real quick. Well, you put that light on if you need a light behind you. Let's see how that looks. Sure. Yeah. Let's see what it looks like with that one off. Oh. I like that. Okay. All right. Tell me what your name is and in what war did you serve? Henry Terpstra. Right now I'm 94 years old. Three. Four. Four? <laughs> and, uh, I always say 93. I served in World War II over in Africa and, and Italy. All right. I don't want to go too far, but I don't know what. Yeah, no, I think that's perfect. And here we go. Here we go. All right. You were drafted, weren't you, Hank? No. Well, I was in a way. Uh, well, I enlisted. You were going to be drafted, so you enlisted. Yeah, so I enlisted. Yeah. And I joined the Air Corps. And that's what I figured we were going in for, is the Air Corps. You thought he was going to go in And the once Air we Corps, got yeah. to Grand Rat, Grand, Grant, Camp Grant, we all, the whole bunch of us, lined up in a corporal nurse's. Welcome, fellas. You're all in the medical corps, the army. The army now. Yeah. So, um, let's see. So today's date is uh, March 21st, and tell me what state are we in right now? Where Where do you live? We're in Michigan. That's right. All right. Fremont, Michigan. Where were you born? I was born in South Boardman, Michigan. Who are your parents, and what do they do for work? John and Grace Terpstra, they, they were from Michigan, too, and then they moved to Illinois. And my dad was a, a steam fitter, they'd call him in them days. He was like a, a maintenance man. And my mother uh, did housework. I'm make sure this is working. What kind of education do you have? Uh, I graduated from high school. Did you uh, have any jobs before going into the service? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I graduated from high school and in between summers I worked in auto parts, automobile parts. And I worked there until I went in service. You were a mechanic, weren't you? No, not first. Oh, later. Auto parts. So why did you choose to join the military as opposed to waiting to be drafted? Uh, I guess there's two reasons. One, I knew I was going to get drafted. So I figured I could join and pick the, the party I wanted, the, the, what, what I wanted to go in. And the other one was my country. I knew all the the young people were going to go, so I figured I'd, I'd go to them and get it over with. When you entered the service, you left how many siblings behind when you went in? Who, who stayed home? How many? Uh, let's see. George. George wasn't born then yet. Well. There was nine of us all together, with me bearing off of there is eight, and I think, I don't think George was born, so there'd be seven. Hmm. Seven siblings. Were there any um, uh, commodities, any things that you owned that you uh, missed when you entered service that you left at home? Anything that you owned that you uh, couldn't bring with you? Of course, my car. At that time, I had a car. What kind of car was that? Hmm? 
What kind of car was that? Uh, 35 Ford. So what branch did you join? What branch did you intend to join? Well, I intended, I mean, I thought I wasn't in, it would have been a, a, a pilot for the Air Corps. That's what I intended to join. And uh, if I couldn't get in there, I was going to get into the ground, court, ground crew for the Air Corps, repairing the motors and stuff like that. I didn't have any idea of joining the medical department. None at all. That was the least of my intentions to join the medical department. So what actually happened? Well, we all got, after I joined and stuff, we all had a date to go to Camp Grant. We went by bus, by train, and then a, 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 a truck picked us up at, at the train station in Camp Grant at Grant and brought us to Camp Grant and there we lined up right outside. Grant was a, a tent city. There was no permanent buildings there. It was all tents. Uh, so it looked like it was a city just camped just set up for World War II and then that was it. It was tent city and we got all there and he says, Congratulations, you're all in the Army Medical Corps. And we all were downcast. So what type of training and schooling did you have? And there, uh, our training was three months. Uh, most of it was, uh, we were going to be uh, first aid, uh, the first aid but it's still up on the front lines. Then there, there's a medics that look back and take you after you re, after the front lines repair you. Then these other medics take you back to the to the aid station or to the hospital back there. And then there's medics that work in the hospital. There's three different groups. I worked in the the first medics that would meet people when they're wounded. How long did you train for? Three months. Can you speak to just a little bit what kind of things they would have you do in training? Well, uh, we had, uh, every once in a while we'd stay in and train from a book, looking at a book, how to bandage people, what kind of medicine to give them and stuff like that. And our on the field training was <coughs> they would intend a person would have a broken arm and you'd have to repair it, a broken leg and you'd have to repair it, and stuff like that out on the field. That and then we also had training where uh, you you're on the front line and you're you bandaged a, a soldier up. And whether you whether you put them on a, a, a litter litter to carry them back, or whether you're just plain going to drag them back, you have to. We had to stay under 30 inches. There was gunfire above that, so you didn't want to raise up over 30 inches. You'd get shot. And uh, so we had to learn how to drag a person, how to get a person back. And a lot of times it'd take us four, four medics would get a guy and we'd, we'd crawl on our belly directly, pushing that litter where the person's on and to, to where it's safe and then we'd get up and carry him. Do you remember any of your instructors? Do any of them stand out to you? Our, the general there was Stone, General Stone. He was our commander. Outside that, I don't remember any of them, no. What was your first assignment after basic training? Uh, our first assignment was we went from basic training to Newport News, Virginia, and there we waited for a ship 
to take us overseas. And when the ship took us overseas, it stopped right outside of Naples. And then we got on a smaller boat and went into Naples. The harbor was so full, so full of boats sunk and stuff that we couldn't get in with a big boat. So we had to take a small boat in. And then we all went and camped. They had a, a, a volcano crater just outside of Naples where they had cleaned out a little bit. And that's where we camped for a couple of days while we got organized. And then we left there and we were walked from there all the way to, boy, across northern Africa to just below Sicily, Italy. And there we got on the boat again and went up to Italy. But in that walking, we walked all the way. We were, what we were doing is uh, the it Italians were fighting the Ger with the Germans at that time. So we would go in every city and every house along the way and make sure there was no Italians or Germans in there, soldiers, and would get them, capture them. And that was our first assignment, clean out South Africa, North, that'd be North Africa. Did you qualify with any equipment, vehicles, aircraft, radio, weapons? Did I do what? qualify in boot camp? Do they train you on any of those things? No. Nothing, nothing like that. At any point in your career in the military, did you f use a firearm? Nope. Nope. What do you consider to be the hardest part of your training? The hardest part of the training was, was schooling. I, if I not what what pills are named and what you have to use them and then we had to give all our soldiers in our in our battalion and regiment a shot and that was a little hard you had everybody a shot so you'd probably give 300 shots a day during your uh, military career did you receive any promotions? Oh yes, at that time, when I first went in at Camp Grant, I was a PFC. And that book would have told me when I got my uh, regular first, private, first pri grade. private first grade. Uh, I think I got that right there in, in Africa, in Casablanca where we landed. And then in Italy, I got the corporal. And then later on in Italy again, North Italy, I got uh, uh, corporal fifth grade, medical fifth grade. That's what I ended up with at the end of the war. That was a grade that you could run, a, run an aid station that's what I, I did when uh, near the end of the war. I'll get to that later, where I run an aid station. What was the hardest part of the military lifestyle that you had to adapt to? Well. I guess the hardest part is if we, if we move from one place to another, and there were some wounded soldiers, we'd had to carry them from one spot to the other. If we had good roads, we had a jeep that would carry, would carry them. But otherwise, we had to carry them there. So the physical labor was probably yeah, the hardest. Yeah. On the other end, what was the easiest part, or was any of it easy? <laughs> Nothing was real easy. Uh, uh, Did you find worshiping easy? Well, yeah, it. Uh, 
took a little work getting something ready to say, but otherwise, uh, worship wasn't bad. They, the army, bought us New Testaments that we used, and uh, we had hymn books that they, our, our cook carried around with them and carried these New Testaments, but they had a truck. And when they had hauled their cooking stuff around, they'd haul our, our Bibles and song books around, hymn books. Can you give me a brief overview of the places that you served? Well, a uh, brief overview, when I landed in Casablanca in, in North Africa and then we went from there to a, a, a volcano that was there and that had all the, had the protection because it was a volcano, it was sunk in and we were down in. And uh, that was protection for us. Uh, in, let me go ahead a little bit. In them days, uh, the Germans and the Italians, who they were fighting against, they had artillery pieces that would explode only on contact. So they couldn't set them for exploding at a certain time period. They exploded in contact. Towards the end of the war, I'll get to that later, but they, they would, if they wanted it to explode in the air over a certain spot, they could set it for so many seconds. And they'd set it and it'd explode right above you. And they, those were the bad ones. Those you couldn't hide from. Otherwise, when they explode, when they, they hit the ground, we'd dig a, a, a trench. As long as it was, uh, oh, six, eight inches above us when we laid down in it, you were pretty safe. Because even the bullets, or even the, if these hit the ground and exploded, They'd go along the ground and be over the top of you. And if you were underground a little ways, they wouldn't damage you. But by the end of the war, that wasn't, they'd explode in the air and then they could get you. So after you were at the volcano area, where did you go next? We, volcano okay, area, we divided up there in, in platoons of groups. And I think we had, oh, 15 people maybe in a group and we'd march all the way going to southern Italy and uh, we'd all get a group and it was one group there's a farmhouse or a little regiment over there we'd all we'd go over there just our group and clean it out and then someone else would go to another group and we just kept walking across uh, northern uh, Africa, it was um, Morocco. And where'd you go next after Morocco? Well, there we got, when, it, at the, when we got clear across Africa, this tip is quite a ways. We was at the Mediterranean Sea, and there we got in little uh, boats and went to Sicily. In Sicily, we, we didn't stay there long, just a couple days. We got in smaller boats, and from there we went to Naples. And we had to get the smaller boats because there were so, too many boats that were sunk in the harbors that the big boats couldn't get in there. So we had to go by little boats. And uh, that would bring us from there to, to uh, Naples, Italy. And there, from Naples, we went to another crater, uh, 
Mount Zuvius, which was a, uh, yeah, what do you call it? Mount. A crater that's mm -hmm. uh, working, you know. And uh, there we we lined up again and got all in in certain groups. And uh, there we we start walking. Most of us walked. When there was a big gap, we maybe got in on a car or a train, a plane, a tank. But otherwise, we walked pretty much across northern Africa. And uh, any little house, we'd go there and make sure there was no Germans or Italian soldiers there, and no to clean it out and get rid of them. And we did that along all, the whole North Africa. And in a little village, we'd get a couple of us groups go in there and make sure there's no Italians or Germans in there. Clean them out. So we did that. Now, let me say that before we did this, Patton went through here with his tanks. And, and secured it for us. He he got uh, after the German tanks and stuff, but it was the individual soldiers that were still living. There, there was no tanks, no German tanks that we had to worry about. It was just the individual soldiers that were in these houses. And to tell you that the Italians were pretty good. Yeah, they'd see us coming to their little village or a couple of houses, they'd come out and meet us and tell us such and such a house has got Germans or Italian soldiers in. So they'd tell us. So we had a lot of uh, information in before we went to these houses. Okay. Where were you when the war ended? And when do you recall, um, do you remember the date at which you were told to stop fighting? Well, you know, we were in northern Italy, pretty close to Switzerland. And uh, all of a sudden, there every night, the German airplanes would fly overhead and shoot at us and stuff like that. Well, then. If I knew what day the war ended, about a week before it ended, the the Germans soldiers airplanes didn't come over anymore. So we knew that something was happening, and uh, so it was. And then a lot of the Germans, now they knew about it before we did. They would come with a white flag, 10, 15, 20 at a time, surrendering, surrendering. And we didn't know why, but we assumed that it was because they were giving up. But the war was over for them, and they didn't want to get shot. So they surrendered to us. And uh, so they were surrendering in, in great numbers. And that's when we were finally told that the Germans had surrendered. So victory in Europe Day was May 8, 1945. So would you say about a week before or A week, week before, yeah. Yeah. And up to that point, German soldiers were um, surrendering even before that, a while? Uh, yeah, but, but not, not as great number. Uh, now I, I was walking back to to, the, to headquarters to get some stuff from my aid station, and while I was walking, a couple of Germans jumped up in front of me, scared the daylights out of me. But they holding the flag up, they surrendered. I was a medic, and they surrendered because they knew the war was over, and they figured, here's a guy that don't have a gun. <coughs> <laughs> He's not going <laughs> to hurt us. So they surrendered to me and I brought them 
brought them to headquarters while I was going that way. Can you tell me about when you were in Africa? Do any particular battles stand out to you? In Africa, we didn't have a battle. It was all cleanup. We had, uh, or maybe you'd meet 10 German soldiers in a town and they'd put up a little fight, but in an hour you had them surrendered. So it wasn't really a battle. How about in Italy? Yeah, Italy was a lot of battles. We'd, in Italy, well, I guess the, the General uh, Mark Clark was general then. He would assign us to uh, a certain uh, object and get it, that's your object to get to, and that'd be a battle. We'd get around, go around and everything, <coughs> and get to it, <coughs> and get to this thing, and sur have that village surrender. <laughs> oh boy. Were you ever a prisoner of war? Yes, but I was not registered as a prisoner of war. We, uh, our, our, our forces, Americans, we took, we captured a town and we had quite a few German prisoners and there was a, a, a building there in town. So we got that as an aid station. I had that as an aid station and they brought the, the wounded in and I was there fix, fixing them up. And then the Germans came back and retook this town. And I stayed there in this, that uh, building. But then I was repairing I, German soldiers too, as well as the American. And for two days, I was in that city with German soldiers around me, repairing G German soldiers. And then after two days, the Americans come back and took that city again and pushed the Germans out. And it was free. Now that was, uh, it could be a prisoner of war, but it wasn't registered because it wasn't long enough for the, the company to get it written down or whatever they had to do. So I wasn't registered as a prisoner of war. How did you stay in touch with family and friends and your church when you were in, oh, in, in service? Mostly by letter. I wrote letters <coughs> to the church, to Marie, to my mother, and also to... We have something called email. Airmail, air, air, air I guess. It was, a, email. it was a letter that we would write on a uh, regular form, and then they would they would check it. The soldiers would check it before they mailed it out and read it. And if there's something in there that they didn't like, they would black it out or cut it out. Yeah. But then this form was reduced to about half the size. It's a real small. And he said it was called. A, E letter, email, email, and that's what we sent. That's what was sent to all the people around here, our church, and the friends that I had and stuff. What did you do for recreation, um, or just what would you do when you were off duty? Uh, I can remember playing football. Uh, Went so off the gang of us would play uh, different. You're on this side, and we're on this side, and kick the football, and we had to get through the crowd to get over to this side, and and just to, just a plain touch football. Yeah, and then towards the end of the war, of course, I joined the ball game, ball team, and then we 
Дай Богом. Tell me about uh, what your religious religious experience was like uh, overseas. Well, it was for me. It was pretty good because uh, back home I had a fella by the name of Arthur Ryberg and his wife Barb Ryberg, and they kept me on the straight and narrow path and uh, told me everything I had to know, and I ate with them and I did quite a bit of stuff with them and they kept me going and uh, so there I just followed what I knew from them and kept uh, kept in touch with God. Do you recall any particularly humorous or just kind of unusual events that occurred when you were overseas? No, I don't. Uh, okay. When did you return home? When I returned home? Yeah, when was that? Or, or about how long after well, the war the, ended? The war over there was over in, in May. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, over there, we were, first we were divided up by numbers. Uh, we got two points for this and two points for that and two points for this and that. And I had enough numbers to leave Italy right away and get go home. Uh, once we get organized for this. And then I was playing on a ball team and I didn't want to, I wanted to play ball some more. So I stayed, I dropped my thing and I had Elvin Corbin take my place to go home. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that was that there. See? So I, I stayed and Toured, toured around Europe, playing ball with different outfits. You see, tell me about who Alvin Corbin. Orphan, who Alvin him? Corbin. Uh, when we were going across Africa and Italy, we had everybody had a what we called a pup tent. It took two two people to carry the parts to make one pop tent. So each person had one half of the, the canvas that goes across the top and one pole and about five stakes that go in the ground. And that would make a complete tent. And that's what we, we slept in. And uh, Alvin Corbin, he was another Christian, so we slept together quite a bit of the whole trip in Europe and across Italy. He was he was another medic, and uh, we went all the way across Africa and Italy together. So then, when the war was over, he was pretty homesick, and he wanted to go home bad. So. I wasn't concerned much about it. I like to go home too, but I wanted to play ball. So I stayed there and I left him go home under my numbers, my pass. So we got arranged for him to go home. Well then, we were in northern Italy and we had to go way down to Naples to get on a boat. To get, go home. And there was a lot of mountains in Italy. And uh, our, our tanks put blades on the front and they made passes on these mountains, uh, alongside the mountains and stuff to, that we could use to get around. And, uh, so from northern Italy, they got in one of these army trucks 
where there was about, they carry about, oh, 15 fellows in the back end. And they were going on the pass to go back to Naples. And I don't know where at in Italy because I never found out where at that. But when they were going, here was coming an Italian horse pulling a wagon coming up the pass. And this pass wasn't very wide, just it was made by one tank. And so the driver of our truck moved over to the side of the thing that was cut out where you could look straight down and the horse had the other side which was a wall next to him and I don't know if the our truck driver got out a little too far or if that dirt broke loose behind the rear wheel when he was over there but it it broke loose and the truck went tumbling down the road no. And I don't know how many people died, but Elvin Corbin died, which was in my place. So I just figured I would have been there and I would have died. All through service Africa and Italy, and he held services with me uh, back in, in Italy whenever we'd get off the front lines. Our, our cook was a Christian and we had, he, he would, he had a truck to drive with all his cook stuff in, kitchen stuff in, and he would carry our, our Bibles and our songbooks. And when we'd get to a place, then Elvin Corbin and me would have a church service and they, we had our books and Bibles in in that truck. So that truck was always with us, the kitchen truck. And we would have services along the way. And so Elvin and me were, well, we were together quite a bit at a time. And uh, so then I left him go and he went home, going home. But he was in his truck that went just a little too far to the end of the, the road there and the back end fell down and the truck rolled down the hill. And like I say, he died. I don't know how many people died in there, but that was the end of that, our life together. So how did uh, Alvin's passing affect you? Well, it, it did because he was one friend that I had overseas that was a real friend. Uh, we were both Christians and we held services together and we were together quite a bit of the time. Yeah. So it was like losing a brother. When you returned home, how are you received by your family and your church and your community and your girlfriend? Oh, pretty like a hero. <laughs> yeah, pretty uh, pretty nice. Uh, they were happy to see me, and uh, people were proud of him. Yeah, was there a party? I don't think so. I don't think there was a party. There was coffee at church probably that was about it <laughs> church church was our main thing at home uh, so of course church got a hold of me right away and wanted to know stuff about the army and so forth how did you readjust to home life Well, it's one of these things that the first time you're gone, so everybody was gone, everybody was coming home, so you just, 
made uh, made the best of it, you know. And they were happy to see you. How soon after the war did you go back to work? And what did you do? Oh boy. I think I went back pretty fast, right after my my brother Dave, he got discharged the same day I did. He came home from Europe too and uh and we were home and so oh probably probably two days I imagine. We went to uh the electric company, public service to get a job. And I was I was ready to be a meter reader or something like that. So we both of us went to take a physical and, a, and, and fill out an application. And my brother was in front of me and I was behind him. So he went in and filled out one and then I was the next come. And uh, the fellow that was given our, our test he says, you, you can have a job as a meter reader, but he says, your brother doesn't, isn't going to get a job. He didn't go to high school. He just went to grade school. He says, we can't give him a job. So <laughs> I was stubborn. So I said, well, then I don't want the job either. <laughs> that was nice of you. Yeah. So if you don't get the job, I don't want it either. So then... I don't know where he went, but from there I went and uh, I worked for a fellow a little bit before I went in service. He worked out of his garage repairing cars. And so I was with him a little bit and uh, repairing cars. So I went back to him and says, asked him if he had, if he wanted me to work for him again. He says, sure, come on. So I went there. And he bought his, he, he was working on cars, and he, put all, he bought all his stuff from Old Park Auto Supply. It was a, a supply for vehicles and stuff, vehicle supplies. So I went there to pick up some stuff, and then the, the owners of Old Park Auto Supply asked me, he says, we need a we need a man over here. He says, "You want to come here and work?" Well, he offered me quite a bit more money, and so I says, "Yeah." So I went to work for him, and I worked for the auto parts, and I was there for quite a while. In fact, we were there yet when I got married. How long after the war did you until you got married? A year and a half. And who's your wife? Marie. And where's Marie? Sitting right here alongside me. <laughs> How did service change you? How do you think life would have been different if you hadn't gone into service? Uh, more, more routine. You don't just get what you want. You. Uh, have to do it, work for it. It isn't passed out to you. After the war, did you join any veteran organization? Uh, not right away. Uh, I joined the American Legion, but quite a bit later. When did you start talking about your war experiences? Talking about work in, in, in repairing vehicles and stuff? No, I mean, uh, how long after the war did you start talking about your life in the war? When did you start telling your family and friends oh. about what happened over there? I think that was constant. It was such a routine thing. Yeah. 
everybody was in the same situation, wasn't it? Kind of. Yeah, just a routine thing. And so bringing us back to Europe, what did you do after the war? So you stayed in, in Europe, you gave your ticket to and Alan then, Corbin, so you stayed for a few months. And, and what played did you ball. Do? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I was on the ball team, and we traveled, traveled throughout Europe. We played different Army baseball teams all throughout Europe. And it was regular, it was organized teamwork, you know. So uh, we'd, we'd play, and they had a regular schedule, playing this and who you'd beat and stuff like that. And uh, so I played that, I think, to finish the year out. And then after that, I decided to go home. Were there any routines in occupation that you were required to do? Were there any different uh, things you had to do for your job in the... No, but we had different things we could pick uh, to go to like a school uh, over there uh, that might help us in civilian life. So I took a job as, as a repairing vehicles. So I repaired the jeeps and the trucks and uh, working there. But it was on your own and you, you didn't have to report or anything to it. It was an army job and you just fix the jeeps and the trucks as they come in and uh, it's a, you learn how to fix them. When did you learn of the Nazi final solution, the killing of the Jews and gypsies and other minority groups? Really not till the war was over with, when they talked about the concentration camps and stuff. I might have still been overseas, but that's when I learned about the, how they treated people. We were told over there that the Japanese weren't treating American soldiers very nice in the prison camps, but we never told that we weren't, weren't told that about the prisoners over there in Europe. Did you see a concentration camp when you were in Europe during the war? No, no, not during the war. I saw it after the war when we went back here. Okay. Have you ever attended any war reunions? Uh, no. Was it because you couldn't find any, or you weren't invited, or you just didn't particularly care to go? You just weren't invited, I guess. Did you benefit from the GI Bill in any way? Yes. Uh, the first house we built in Park Ridge, Illinois, I got a GI loan. And the GI loan was 4.5%, and the regular loans were 72 do you know how much loans are today? No. I can imagine. <laughs> Take a guess. What do you think? I have no idea. Seven fives. About three three percent. Oh, what are we down? Yeah. So it, I got a loan for our first house. I think we paid fifty four dollars a month or something like that on it. Yeah, I don't remember. And I borrowed uh, eight thousand dollars. What message would you like to leave? for future generations who might hear or view this uh, interview? What would you like to tell the next generation? Uh, 
that the people overseas are good. It's just the, the, the managers or the, the bosses over there that's causing all the trouble. It wasn't the individuals. Is that why you refer to Germans as Germans and not Nazis? Right. Right. It, was, it wasn't the German soldiers that we had, uh, you know, mad at. It was the, it was the officers. <coughs> did you ever see Mussolini? Yes, I did. When was that? After he was dead. And where was that? In Milan, Italy. He was hanging. He was hanging by his feet, and his mistress was hanging by her feet alongside of him. Did you go to Berlin after the war um, in occupation? No. no. Tell me about. Let's see. Tell me about your experience first getting to Africa. Backing up a bit. Do you remember? seeing the shore of Africa and then getting there and getting off the boat and stuff and tell me about I never heard about what that camp was like where you first got off that port was that or a built up port by the Americans were there people there already yeah uh, the first place we had uh, we left Newport News which is right just below New York and we had to go all the way down past Cuba towards South America and from there we went across because the Germans had a lot of U-boats, submarines, in the water. And so when we started to head over there, one day our, our boat, we were on the British, uh, third biggest British ship they had. It was a, a luxury boat. So it was a nice boat, luxury boat it was, you know. But there were 6,000 of us troops on there. And not so luxurious. Yeah, so it picked up a, a German U-boat and it made a U-turn and rolled most of us out of bed and went back for one whole day back towards the end of South America. And then we turned around again and went again. But then when we got up to that point, we had two airplanes come and follow us most of the time, flying over us and then flying in front of us and back of us. And then when we got a little closer, we had uh, a boat, a speedboat like come, come, and would go behind us and it would go back and forth and break up the, 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 the wake of the boat. Because that wake stays in the ocean for two, three days and then Germans could follow it. So it, we had to break it up. So this boat just all went back and forth and just broke it up. What do you wish more people knew about veterans? Well, I think there's like almost like two types of veterans. There was veterans that were in World War II. And there's veterans today that are in the in this uh, desert storm. Uh, it, that's a different different type of war. Uh, they they go in the desert there in desert storm and they stay in one spot for a month and just fight there. We were moving all the time. Every day we'd, we'd move forward to get another foothold and move forward. Sometimes we didn't move very far during the day, but we'd move constantly all the time, capturing new parts. That's the way the war was when we were there. What would you like people to know or remember from your story? I hate to say this, but I think that really war war is bad, but it wasn't so bad for me because I I made up my mind to to, to like it 
and to like what I was doing and it didn't affect me. Uh, Was there anything that you've always wanted to share about your experience in the service but you just haven't really had the chance to? No. Is there anything that you want to talk about that we haven't covered? No. Uh, way back in basic training, of course, there we didn't know anything about war. And they made this camp for World War II, and uh, it was tents and stuff like that. And it, it was all tents. And we lived in tents and stuff. And all our classrooms were tents. And uh, so it was, it was, it was outdoor living for us. It wasn't. We didn't live in a, a barracks, which had a bed and a mattress and all that. We lived on on cots and sleeping bags out in a tent. So we never got to really sleeping in in what you'd call cots and barracks like they are now. This was tent city and everything was tents. I think they tore it down now. I don't think there is no more Camp Grant. Anything else you want to talk about? No. Uh... Okay. Well, the Veterans History Project, the Library of Congress, thanks you for your input. <laughs> and uh, they're going to get this, and they're going to review it, and it's, it hopefully will be available for the world so that they can know your story. Really? That they can value your story. How interesting. And historians might also use your story to under, have a better understanding of what went on in yeah. World War II. All right? Yeah, and you can add stuff, you know. You know, we've been talking much about it. and Yeah, I can make notes and send those in as well. Yeah. Else? All right. Sounds good. Okay, let's go out and eat, huh? Absolutely.